Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Devin Fitzpatrick, and I am currently completing a Master of Research degree in Forestry at Inverness College under the supervision of Louise Durad, as well as Peter and Emma, who I believe you will be hearing from or have heard from already today. My project is in partnership with Forestry and Land Scotland and Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, and is focused on the spatial ecology of grey squirrels in the urban habitat of Aberdeen. I'll just briefly touch on the background, as I'm sure most of you are aware of the issues surrounding grey squirrels in Scotland. The grey squirrel was first introduced to the UK during the 19th century, however it was actually a separate introduction, a zoo escape, in the 1970s that allowed them to establish in Aberdeen. They have been classed as one of the world's most invasive species, and of the over 3,000 invasive species in the country, Scottish forestry cites them as posing the greatest risk of significant adverse impact on Scotland's forests. Unlike red squirrels, greys are known to harm young trees through bark stripping, which hinders native woodland creation and regeneration. They also pose a huge threat to our native red squirrels. Greys are larger and outcompete red squirrels for space and resources, and infect them with pathogenic squirrel pox virus. Squirrel pox is carried only asymptomatically by grey squirrels, but is lethal to reds within two weeks. Areas where red squirrel populations have been decimated by squirrel pox, or where squirrels face other threats such as habitat degradation, are quickly colonized by grey squirrels. Despite the propensity for grey squirrels to colonize urban and semi-urban forest environments in both their native and invasive ranges, however, very little is known about urban grey squirrel spatial ecology. The SSRS project team in the northeast of Scotland has been managing an island population of grey squirrels in Aberdeenshire and the city of Aberdeen since 2010, with the target of eventual eradication. Once widely distributed throughout Aberdeenshire, the population is now more or less confined to Aberdeen's city limits, which consists of over 2,300 hectares of woodland. Simulations have indicated that grey squirrel control in Aberdeen is critical to preventing the northward spread of the population. However, to date, control efforts have been hindered by lack of data and a high rate of recolonization. Because the country spends substantial funds on grey squirrel control to protect red squirrels, it is important that existing resources are allocated as effectively as possible. One of the largest identifiable obstacles to achieving SSRS Northeast's target of eradication in Aberdeen is the inability to carry out grey squirrel control in patches of suitable squirrel habitat where they do not hold the required permissions, most notably private gardens. A greater understanding of urban grey squirrel spatial ecology, however, will aid them in overcoming challenges of limited accessibility and allow them to target their efforts with increased efficiency. With my project, we therefore aim to identify habitat preference movement corridors in home range area for grey squirrels in Aberdeen. Here you can see my specific research questions. One, in an urban context, are larger woodland habitat patches preferred? And if trapping efforts are concentrated in these areas, will this continue to draw in grey squirrels from other areas? And two, how far of a reach do traps have in relation to grey squirrel home ranges? So, in order to address these questions, 10 grey squirrels, 5 males and 5 females, were trapped and tagged with GPS VHF radio collars and tracked for approximately 4 months across 5 sites in Aberdeen, beginning in March of this year. Collars were set to record GPS fixes 4 times a day, and squirrels were also radio tracked 2 days a week. This project represents first of its kind research, as not only is it set in an urban environment, but GPS technology was also previously unavailable for squirrel monitoring because of squirrels' small size. The collars we used on grey squirrels for this study would even have been too large to collar reds. Collars shouldn't weigh more than about 4-7% to of the squirrel's body weight, and our greys weighed between 430 to over 600 grams, with females typically weighing more because they were pregnant or nursing. Previous studies have monitored squirrels in forest habitats relying on observation or VHF radar telemetry alone, and almost no studies have monitored grey squirrel home range and habitat selection in an urban environment, with the exception being Townsend et al. who radio tracked grey squirrels in a relatively small urban forest environment on a university campus in their native range. However, this study included only three squirrels. GPS offers a dramatic increase in both the accuracy and amount of data that can be collected, overcoming obstacles posed by varying field conditions that inhibit previous methods. Only two previous studies published have used GPS to track tree squirrels. McNichol et al. tracked 29 grey squirrels in Wales to examine their space use in response to translocated pine martens, and Stevenson et al. tracked four grey squirrels in England to determine movement and land cover preference. Both of these studies, however, were conducted over relatively short time periods, tracking squirrels from just 5 to 24 days. 
For my project, we ended up, as I mentioned, with 10 squirrels with sufficient data for analysis, with tracking duration ranging from 34 to 126 days, an average of 79, and number of fixes ranging from 18 to 539, with an average of 243. Squirrels were trapped and dispatched when their collars stopped working, though as of right now, collars from three squirrels have not been retrieved, so there is potentially more data to be added to analyses. I am currently analyzing data using R statistical software, calculating home ranges using the autocorrelated kernel density estimation method, as well as examining time use metrics using the time local convex hull method, which allows us to see which areas are visited often and for how long, in order to differentiate between high use areas, such as foraging sites or drays, and movement corridors. These home ranges will be overlaid on a habitat map with trap and dray locations to establish habitat preference as well as the impact of external environmental char characteristics on the effectiveness and reach of trap locations. I'm still in the early stages of the project, however, can share preliminary home range results with you. Here you can see the 10 squirrels home ranges and where they are in relation to each other across Aberdeen. The 95% home ranges are shown by the middle line, with the inner and outer lines representing 95% confidence intervals around that. There's a few interesting things to note here. For one thing, there is a significant variation in size between individuals' ranges. The females range in size from just over 1 hectare to about 13 hectares, whereas the males range in size from about 4 hectares to over 99 hectares, shown here in yellow, which is rather unprecedented compared to previous studies. Previous studies have reported gray squirrel ranges from about 0.5 to 4.5 hectares, with the maximum I've come across in the literature being 10.4 hectares. Male home ranges tend to be slightly larger than females in most studies. Home range size is largely dependent on habitat quality, for example the availability of food resources, which is one of the notable differences between urban and natural areas that may shape urban home ranges. There is a large amount of supplemental feeding that occurs in addition to naturally available food in Aberdeen. This can in turn support higher densities of squirrels, as evidenced by smaller and increasingly overlapped home ranges seen in urban red squirrels. Squirrels can fulfill their energy requirements with a minimal energy expenditure competition, and it also allows females to start breeding earlier in the season when they reach adequate body size. We had one individual, for example, M5, shown here in blue, who frequented a specific private garden where we know he was hand-fed by the property owner. We can already see that squirrels are making some use of private gardens, as well as parks and woodland patches, though in what capacity still needs to be determined. We also see plenty of overlap between home ranges, which included this male, M3, shown in orange, and female, F5, shown in red, often located together when radio tracking. When looking at these ranges, it is also worth noting that females tend to stay around the dray more when pregnant or nursing. Lastly, I thought it would be useful to include some information on urban red squirrel spatial ecology. Multiple studies have shown urban parks host greater densities of red squirrels than do woodlands on the outskirts of urban areas. Woodland patches that are greater than 5 hectares have high quality habitat and are well connected to other patches are more likely to be occupied by red squirrels. They are likely to avoid roads, especially larger ones, except when dispersing, and will avoid unsuitable habitat such as fields and buildings where possible. Dispersal distances are relatively shorter in urban as opposed to natural areas, however the gene pool remains diverse due to immigration. Articles published on urban ecology have been increasing in the last 5-10 to 10 years, indicating a growing realization that its understanding is imperative to management and conservation. However, studies specific to gray squirrels are still significantly lacking. We therefore look forward to contributing our results to this knowledge gap and enabling the SSRS Northeast team to carry out their eradication program more effectively through identification of areas in which control efforts can be concentrated, making a significant contribution to red squirrel conservation. Thank you for listening.